Hey guys and welcome back for another Unsolved Mystery where today I want to share with you the baffling and downright creepy tale of The Watcher House. Now this isn't a story that involves any death and some people argue whether there was any crime committed here at all but it really was the stuff of nightmares. This is the true story of The Watcher House, the family that bought it and the anonymous letter writer that made their life hell. The first news of this story came out in the New York Times' The Cut back in 2018 and I do just want to give a quick shout out to the article as it was the main source of this video. I would really recommend giving the full article a read, it is so well written and such a good article. But before we get into the rest of the video, I just want to say a huge thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring us today. I always get so excited when HelloFresh wants to sponsor my videos because I've been a huge fan of the company for years and as always, just to prove it, in case you doubt me, here is my HelloFresh recipe book filled to the brim with recipes that I've used over the years. I can't show you properly because I haven't whole punched half the recipes and they're just going to fall out but, you know, that's quite a chunk. I solely thank HelloFresh for teaching me how to cook when I moved out of my parents' house as a baby all those years ago and I use those recipes in that book every single day. Even if I don't have a box, I'm using one of those recipes. HelloFresh delivers recipe boxes to your front door as often as you want them, providing you with everything you need to create delicious recipes from scratch. This week we've chosen Herbie Parsley Chicken, Creamy Pesto Pasta, I love this one, and seared duck breast in balsamic gastrique sauce. I'm really in the mood for some pasta tonight, so I think I'm gonna cook the creamy pesto pasta. This creamy pesto pasta dish is one of my favorite pasta dishes that I make. It is so creamy and so indulgent, but it literally only takes 20 minutes. There are so many reasons why I personally love HelloFresh. I mean, the people in my life are sick to death and be constantly trying to make them join. For me, honestly, it's the ease, I think, that keeps you coming back. Like, me and my girlfriend, we're very sociable people. We don't know from one night to the next where we're gonna be. Oh, Crumbles decides to come join, hello. <laughs> we never know where we're gonna be from one day to the next, but it's so nice to know that at least three nights a week we've got fresh, delicious, healthy HelloFresh meals waiting for us. And I don't need to keep making my weekly trips to the supermarket, I need to end up throwing away a load of rotten vegetables at the end of the week because we just haven't used them. Instead we choose our three HelloFresh meals a week, although you can get more if you want. They're delicious, they're healthy, they're easy to make, and we don't have to stress about what we're doing for dinner each night, although we do still get stressed over choosing which one we want. <laughs> and it's made me try so many foods I just didn't like before or just never would have tried. Turns out, if you cook cabbage right, it's glorious. Cabbage, it's amazing. Cooking with HelloFresh is just such a stress-free, easy experience. I always enjoy the whole process beginning to end, but particularly the end bit where I get to eat the food. If you want to use my code Georgia Marie, you'll get 50% off your first box, 35% off your next three, and three free gifts. Crumble, are you trying to get in the box? This is another great thing as well by HelloFresh. The boxes keep my cats entertained for hours. She's gonna love that all afternoon. You absolutely will not regret trying HelloFresh out, I promise you. The people at the centre of this story are the Broadus family, Maria and Derek Broadus and their three children. Shortly after Derek's 40th birthday, the family purchased their dream home, 657 Boulevard in Westfield, New Jersey, less than 30 miles from Manhattan where Derek was the senior vice president at an insurance company. The house was their dream home, it was just a few streets away from where Marie had grown up, it was beautiful and it was the perfect home for their family. It was a six bedroom, 3,800 feet colonial style home built in 1905 and it only had a handful of owners before the Broadses came to buy it in 2014 for just over 1.3 million dollars. The family didn't immediately move in as they did have about $100,000 worth of renovations planned for the property just to modernise it a little bit. So straight after escrow, which I think is the same as completion here in the UK, the family got started on these renovations. Three days later, Derek goes to check the post and finds a few letters in there, mostly just bills, but one envelope stood out to him. It was a white envelope about the size of a card addressed to the new owner. As anyone would do, Derek obviously opened the letter, and here is what it said. Dearest new neighbour at 657 Boulevard, allow me to welcome you to the neighbourhood. How did you end up here? Did 657 Boulevard call to you with its force within? 657 Boulevard has been the subject of my family for decades now, and as it approaches its 110th birthday, I've been put in charge of watching and waiting for its second coming. 
My grandfather watched the house in the 1920s and my father watched it in the 1960s. It is now my time. Do you know the history of the house? Do you know what lies within the walls of 657 Boulevard? Why are you here? I will find out. I see already that you have flooded 657 Boulevard with contractors so that you can destroy the house as it was supposed to be. Tusk, 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 bad move. You don't want to make 657 Boulevard unhappy. You have children, I have seen them. So far I think there are three that I have counted. Are there more on the way? Do you need to fill the house with the young blood I requested? Better for me? Was your old house too small for the growing family? Or was it greed to bring me your children? Once I know their names, I will call to them and draw them to me. Who am I? There are hundreds and hundreds of cars that drive by 657 Boulevard each day. Maybe I am in one. Look at all the windows you can see from 657 Boulevard, all the people who stroll by each day. Maybe I am one. Welcome, my friends, welcome. Let the party begin. Signed, The Watcher. I mean, imagine moving into your new home, your dream home that you've spent so much money on and receiving something like that. I mean, I did recently buy my own house and I know if I open my post to find a letter like this one, I would have been out of there so fast. CCTV cameras set up before you can even blink. Derek was also obviously freaked out by this. It was very late at night, he was alone, and he immediately ran around the house turning off all the lights so no one could see inside. Then he called the Westfield Police Department who immediately sent an officer around. This officer was just as creeped out by the letter as Derek and he asked if Derek had any enemies who might want to send him something like this, and he didn't as far as he was aware. So Derek heads back home to Maria and the kids, and remember they hadn't officially moved into 657 Boulevard at this point, they were still doing the renovations. He shared what had happened with Maria and decided to contact the house's previous owners. If the watcher was telling the truth and this was an actual thing, then surely the previous owners would have also have received contact from them over the years as well. Now these previous owners were Andrea and John Wood, and the Broadsters sent them an email asking if they knew anything about this. Andrea quickly came back to them saying the first they'd heard of the Watcher was actually just a few days before moving out, when they'd received a similar creepy letter. This letter did make mention of a Watcher watching the house, but the Woodses had been there for 23 years and they never received anything like this before. So I guess they just brushed off this letter as some kind of prank or kids messing about and they'd throw it away and didn't give it a second thought. But now it had new meaning. That very same day, the Woodses went with Maria Broadus to the police station to report this new development, and investigators made it very, very clear that the Broadses weren't to talk to any neighbours about this letter they'd received, as all their neighbours were now suspects. But they all hoped this wouldn't be a reoccurring thing, hopefully the letter was just a one-off from somebody thinking they were being funny. But of course, that wasn't to be the case, because just two weeks later, Maria stopped by the house to check in on some paint samples, and she decided to check the post. In there was another letter, this time addressed to Mr and Mrs Bradus. Their names misspelt, which is odd in itself. Was this maybe a genuine spelling error, or had the watcher perhaps just heard the new owner's names through the grapevine and had misheard it? Maybe they guessed how to spell it. And this letter was even more creepy than the last. This time it addressed all three children by age and by their nicknames. Notably not their full names, but instead the ones that perhaps Maria and Derek would shout out to get their attention. It certainly seemed like this was a neighbour just overhearing things from the house and garden. And a part of this letter read, I am pleased to know your names now and the name of the young blood you have brought to me. You certainly say their names often. Then it refers to one of their children in particular, asking about an easel inside the home's closed porch. It asked if this child was the artist in the family. Now, nobody should have been able to see this easel from the outside unless you're standing in very specific spots around the house. 657 Boulevard is anxious for you to move in. It has been years and years since the young blood ruled the hallways of the house. Have you found all of the secrets it holds yet? Will the young blood play in the basement? Or are they too afraid to go down there alone? I would be very afraid if I were them. It is far away from the rest of the house. If you were upstairs, you would never hear them scream. Will they sleep in the attic? Or will you all sleep on the second floor? Who has the bedrooms facing the street? I'll know as soon as you move in. It will help me to know who is in which bedroom. Then I can plan better. 
All of the windows and doors in 657 Boulevard allow me to watch you and track you as you move through the house. Who am I? I am the Watcher and have been in control of 657 Boulevard for the better part of two decades now. The Woods family turned it over to you. It was their time to move on and kindly sold it when I asked them to. I pass by many times a day. 657 Boulevard is my job, my life, my obsession. And now you are too, Bridal's family. Welcome to the product of your greed. Greed is what brought the past three families to 657 Boulevard and now it has brought you to me. Have a happy moving in day. You know I will be watching. This whole letter is more threatening in tone than the first, which whilst the first was undeniably creepy, was more of a creepy welcome. Now it seems like something bad is about to go down. The reference, like I said, to the easel in a covered porch was a particular point of concern because this wasn't easily seen by people outside the house. As any good parents would do, the Broadseers immediately made the decision to stop bringing their children to this house and even they would hesitate before going to visit. They even had second thoughts as to whether they wanted to move into the house at all. And then weeks later they received a third letter saying, Where have you gone to? 657 Boulevard is missing you. Too scared to move into their gorgeous new home, a full police investigation took place, with a man called Detective Lugo taking the lead. After examining the postage stamps on the letters, it was found that whoever was sending them was definitely local. These letters had been processed at a distribution centre in Kearney, northern New Jersey, so it definitely wasn't from somebody far away, which makes sense seeing as they knew so much information about the house, and eventually they knew a lot of information about the Broadsters too, this was clearly somebody actually watching. Also, it's worth noting that the Woodses never even put up a for sale sign outside the house, so you wouldn't have even known this house was up for sale unless you were very local, potentially a neighbour who the Woods either told or maybe somebody who heard through neighbourhood gossip. And this is important because it would transpire that the first letter addressed to the new owner was postmarked before the sale had even been made public, and only one day after the contractors first arrived at the house. And as all this renovation work was on the interior of the house, you wouldn't have necessarily heard or seen anything unless you were particularly eagle-eyed, unless you were watching the house. Following investigators' advice, the Broadsters never did tell any of their neighbours about these letters, but through getting to know their new neighbours, they did hear some rumours, some things that piqued their interest. One neighbour who lived two doors down, called John Schmidt, told Derek about a family called the Langfords, who resided in the house between them. Schmidt said that the family was just a bit odd, consisting of Peggy Langford, who was in her 90s, and all of her adult children, all of whom were in their 60s and still lived with her. They were harmless, but the living situation did raise some eyebrows in the local community. John told Derek specifically about Michael Langford, who he described as a Boo Radley character. Now, Boo Radley is a character from Harper Lee's Kill a Mockingbird, who's reclusive and just overall misunderstood by the people in his community. It would later turn out that Michael had been diagnosed with schizophrenia when he was younger, and Derek obviously went to Detective Lugo to tell him what he'd heard about the Langfords. Lugo then pulls in Michael Langford for an interview, and he of course denies all knowledge of the letters, but according to the Broadsters, things he said did apparently match with the general theme of the letters. It was thought in these very early days that Michael Langford was a good suspect, but without an actual confession, there wasn't too much the police could do, and there was zero evidence against him, literally nothing to suggest. But the Broadsters weren't really all too willing to accept this. I mean, in the letters, there were threats being made against their children's lives. Were they just supposed to hope they were empty threats and no harm would actually come to them? Or were they gonna take action? So they took matters into their own hands. Derek set up cameras, as anyone would do, and would hang out at the property late into the night, hiding in the shadows, just lying in wait for the watcher to come and drop off the next letter. But he never caught anyone. They hired a private investigator who also didn't find anything of note, and Derek even reached out to a former FBI agent who he knew to help him, and the FBI conducted a bit of a threat assessment. Maybe this does seem a bit extreme to some, but I very much get it. You've just bought your dream home for well over a million dollars, you've started to plan your lives there, and then this happens. You know full well that you can't sell the home nor live there in peace until the person responsible is apprehended. Maybe some people would be brave enough to go and continue living their lives and ignore the letters, just live in defiance, but I think the inclusion of the kids here made that pretty impossible. 
Also, any person who could write letters like this was likely unhinged anyway. There were some really strange erraticisms within the letters themselves, wrong dates, wrong spellings, and just this very obvious anger. It was also said that there were several old-fashioned ticks within these letters that pointed to the writer being older, things that younger generations wouldn't necessarily do or aren't taught to do. Like the envelope was addressed to M slash M Broadus, that's not really something people do nowadays. It spoke of the weather making small talk and the sentences had double spaces between them, which again is very much an older generation thing. Overall language also led the FBI agents to believe that this probably was an older person. As well as this, the Broaduses also hired a forensic linguist who scoured the internet for clues, looking in local online forums for similar writing and similar opinions and he couldn't find any overlap whatsoever, but he did say that he thought The Watcher might be a Game of Thrones fan, he referenced the Watchers on the wall. And speaking of the walls, you also probably didn't miss The Watcher's previous reference to what they'd find in the walls of the home. Derek did get a home inspector out to literally check between the walls, who knows what they thought they were going to find, but the only issue the home inspector found was said to be the lack of insulation in there. A third letter was received on July 18th, 2014, exactly one month after the second. The house is crying from all the pain it's going through. You have changed it and made it so fancy. You are stealing its history. It cries for the past and what used to be in the time when I roamed its halls. But the 1960s were a good time for 6x7 Boulevard when I ran from room to room imagining the life with the rich occupants there. The house was full of life and young blood. Then it got old and so did my father, but he kept watching until the day he died. And now I watch and wait for the day when the young blood will be mine again. I think there's a massive clue in this because the watcher literally talks about running room to room. So you'd think it'd be quite easy to go back and just see who lived in the house in the 60s and there'll be your answer. Turns out nothing came of that. The family who lived there in the 60s denied any knowledge of this. There wasn't really anyone who fit this profile. The investigation continued and the Broadsters kept their focus on their direct neighbours, the Langfords. At one point the Broadsters literally sent the Langfords a letter saying that they had plans to tear down the whole house, kind of hoping to provoke them in some way, but they didn't really seem to care. Michael Langford was brought in for a second interview, but without any actual evidence against him and the family as a whole, the police got accused of harassment. Plenty of people who had known Michael and the Langfords for a long time said he never would have been capable of doing something like this, it just wasn't in his nature. If they weren't guilty, then I suppose this absolutely could be considered as harassment. Plus, there were so many other neighbours on this street to consider as suspects as well. I mean, apparently the people who lived directly behind 657 Boulevard had a pair of lawn chairs that they'd sit in just facing the border's home and watching. They were just as likely to be suspects as the Langfords. And the Langfords obviously remain furious about the situation to this very day. Michael sadly died in 2020, and this haunted him for the rest of his life. Running out of other options, things got a bit desperate for the Broaders family. Derek didn't really know where else to turn to, and he wondered if there were supernatural influences at play here. So he contacted his priest and got him to bless the house. Didn't make a difference. By the end of 2014, the renovation was finally complete, nothing had ever been captured on surveillance, and the watcher had been quiet for months. But the family was still hesitant to move in, of course. I mean, imagine being too scared to let your kids go out and play in their own garden, worrying about somebody breaking into the home overnight. In the end, they did go through with a sale on that old house, but instead of moving into 657 Boulevard, they moved into Maria's parents' home instead. The toll that all of this must have taken on Maria and Derek is unimaginable, the stress that this would cause. Maria literally got diagnosed with post-traumatic stress, and six months after they bought the house, they decided to sell it. But as you can guess, this wasn't a straightforward process. They tried to sell the house at first for more money than they bought it for to reflect the expensive renovation work they'd had done, but of course, it wasn't ever going to sell at that price. Although they hadn't told anyone about the Watcher Letters, this was a really gossipy neighbourhood. Everyone in the community kind of knew something weird was going on. There were rumours about stalkers and predators. And the Broadsters would send letters to potential buyers to let them know the basics of what had been going on. But of course, nobody was really interested after that point. And if they were, they would seize the opportunity and offer a much lower rate. But the Broadsters didn't want to take such a huge financial loss. They didn't actually legally have to disclose what was going on to potential buyers, but they couldn't bear the thought of other people going through what they'd been through. So they did tell them. 
I mean, that is a very good sign of character if you ask me. And as time went on, they began to question why the previous owners, the Woods, hadn't disclosed to them when they received their letter from the Watcher just a few days before they moved. In early June 2015, the Broadnesses filed a civil suit against the Woodses and the two companies involved in the sale of the house. The documents of this suit, which are available online, state, This action arises of defendants' fraudulent, avaricious, intentional and negligent concealment and misrepresentation of material facts regarding the single-family dream home the plaintiffs were purchasing. It goes on to say that they did this despite knowing the potential harm that could foreseeably befall the plaintiffs and their three minor children. The suit alleges that in the week of May 26, 2014, John and Andrea Wood received a disturbing letter from the Watcher, whom upon information and belief, noted there would be a new family moving into the home and who claimed a right of possession and or ownership to the home. Upon information and belief, John and Andrea Woods, so desperate to sell the million dollar home, knowingly and willfully failed to disclose to the plaintiffs this disturbing letter. Basically, the Broadsters were arguing that had the Woodses told them about this letter, they might have had second thoughts about moving in and therefore they had been duped. The Woodses said that they had never felt watched in the house and all the years they lived there, it always felt safe and they would even leave the door unlocked a lot of the time. When the letter came through, they said it didn't feel threatening, they just threw it away without a second thought. However, should they have known that peace of mind and security were of paramount importance to the new buyers and their three children? Point 16 of the civil suit document states, Plaintiffs would not be murdered in their present nightmare had the defendants adhered to their common law and statutory duty to disclose and speak honestly regarding the watcher material facts which were uniquely within their knowledge. When presented with this civil suit, the Woods countersued, alleging that the Broadnesses were trying to smear their reputation by working with the media. And there's no doubt this case did become a media sensation. The Broadnesses story of the Watcher went viral, but they decided not to speak publicly about it in order to spare any more attention on their children. This whole court case started in 2015 and it went on for quite a few years before all claims were eventually thrown out of court by 2019. At the time the civil suit started, Westfield Police and Union County Prosecutor's Office were still investigating the letters and the Westfield Mayor even addressed residents directly at a town council meeting, asking anyone with any information about the watcher to speak up. But no one did, and no one has ever been charged in the case despite an exhaustive investigation, although some might argue with this exhaustive thing, because there is reason to speak, the police didn't even speak with all the neighbours. Now I hear you all screaming at your screens, what about DNA? And yes, DNA testing was done, but it didn't really provide any answers. DNA was tested on one of the envelopes and in a twist, it was actually found that this DNA belonged to a woman. Most had just assumed the watcher was a man because of the tone and the style of writing. This caused investigators to look more closely at Michael Langford's sister, Abby, but it was ruled very quickly that her DNA was not a match. And it was after this point in the investigation that the Langfords were ruled out entirely, which was a shock to the Broadnesses because they were also about to file a civil suit against them as well. In talking about this DNA though, it is worth noting this DNA could have belonged to anyone, not necessarily just the letter writer. The letter had to go through the whole postal system before arriving in the Broadnesses mailbox, so it was clutching at straws at best. And if the watcher had any sense, they would be wearing gloves. There are so many stories and theories to ponder on in this case, some of them are more believable than others. Some do still think that the Watcher was a neighbour, perhaps annoyed that new people were moving into the street and were determined to see them off. There doesn't have to be some huge nefarious explanation for this, because some people are just odd. I think I mentioned before about the neighbours behind who would sit in lawn chairs just facing 657 Boulevard. A disgruntled neighbour is for sure as good a theory as any. And in all honesty, I think it is the most likely outcome of this case. I think it probably was a neighbour. There were too many coincidences for it not to be, but which one? So a small lead at one point in the form of a woman who pulled up outside the house one day whilst it was under police surveillance. And the car was there for long enough to raise suspicion, so investigators tracked her down and questioned her. She said that her boyfriend was into some really, really dark video games in which one character he played as was called The Watcher. 
Now I tried to do some of my own research into this but I couldn't find the game in question. There is one game literally called The Watchers but that wasn't released till 2020 so it can't have been that. There's also The Witcher, maybe the girlfriend overheard the name and misheard it but that sounds unlikely. The Witcher I wouldn't say is all that dark. It is dark but not that dark. Police did try to get the boyfriend in for questioning but he never came and seeing as there was no actual evidence against him they really couldn't force him. The Woodses even became suspects eventually, especially the couple's 21 year old son. And the police did ask Andrea to provide a DNA sample to compare to the letter, of course it wasn't a match, and they questioned the son, but nothing incriminating came up. Historicmysteries.com even says that around the time the Woodses received their letter from the Watcher just a couple days before they moved out, another family living on Boulevard also received a mysterious letter around this same time. But again, they thought it was a prank and threw it away, and they never felt any repercussions of this, they never got any more letters, it was just a bit weird. I guess maybe had the Broadsters gone public with the Watcher letters earlier, this neighbour would have piped up and maybe more investigation could have been done on the back of this, but I understand why the Broadsters couldn't really speak publicly about it. If you research this case online, you'll find very quickly that a lot of people, most people, seem to think that Derek Broadus actually sent these letters himself, it was a hoax. Maybe for attention or maybe for something else. I've seen unsubstantiated rumours that the Broadsters were in debt, they were in over their heads with this expensive property, they wanted a reason to claim on insurance, but honestly, I don't really see the logic behind this. If they just wanted to resell the house and recoup some of this money, the last thing they're going to want to do is make moves that are going to seriously devalue the house and get themselves ostracised from the community. And the whole community was furious at such negativity being bought on quiet Westfield. But you know who might want to do something like this? Maybe somebody who missed out on the house to the Broadses, a potential buyer who also viewed the home as their dream home and wanted to buy it themselves, but maybe the Broadses got in there first or they offered more money. Maybe this potential buyer wanted to make the Broadses pull out of the sale or perhaps just resell as quickly as possible and then they could swoop in for a lower price. Now this is pure speculation of course, I would assume investigators looked into this angle and looked at other people who maybe made offers or viewed the house, but I couldn't find that confirmation anywhere. In 2017, they still couldn't sell the house, the Broadsters made an appeal to the planning board in order to split the property and sell it to a developer who could tear down the house and instead build two houses on separate lots instead. This was a good idea, a good plan, only of course the planning board turned it down. So, at a loss of what to do next, they decided to rent out the property instead, and they do find some people who are willing to move in and pay some of the mortgage each month. This was a family with grown up children, two big dogs, they probably weren't going to be hurt. But just two weeks after the renters moved in, another letter arrived. Violent winds are bitter cold to the vile and spiteful Derek and his wench of a wife, Maria. You wonder who the watcher is? Turn around, idiots. Maybe you even spoke to me, one of the so-called neighbours who has no idea who the Watcher could be. Or maybe you do know and are too scared to tell anyone. Good move. I walked by the news trucks where they took over my neighbourhood and mocked me. I watched as you watched from the dark house in an attempt to find me. Telescopes and binoculars are wonderful inventions. 657 Boulevard survived your attempted assault and stood strong with its army of supporters barricading its gates. My soldiers of the boulevard followed my orders to a T. They carried out their mission and saved the souls of 657 Boulevard with my orders. All hail the Watcher. Maybe a car accident, maybe a fire, maybe something as simple as a mild illness that never seems to go away but makes you feel sick day after day after day after day after day. Maybe the mysterious death of a pet, loved ones suddenly die, planes and cars and bicycles crash, bones break. Now of course, Broadsters took this brand new letter to the police in the hope of reinvigorating the investigation, but once again, there wasn't all that much they could do. As Derek said, in my view, it's one of 10 houses in the world. This shouldn't be a difficult case to solve, but regardless, it is still unsolved and it remains open to this very day. In my personal opinion, I'm not 100% convinced that this fourth and final letter is from the same person. It just reads a little bit different to me, but I can't put my finger on why, so if you know why, let me know. But also, a couple years has passed, so maybe writing styles have changed and just language has changed, so I might be overthinking that a bit. In August 2019, the Broadses did finally manage to sell the house, so it's no longer their problem. But they did make a half a million dollar loss on it, which I'm sure was incredibly painful. At that point though, I think you'd just be willing to cut your losses and move on. 
And I have no idea if the new owners have ever received anything from the Watcher. I'd be fascinated to know. In a complete coincidence, you probably won't believe me, but it's a complete coincidence of me planning to do this video this week, it actually looks like there's a brand new Netflix series coming out about The Watcher on the day after I plan to upload this. So that's on the 13th of October 2022, it's created by Ryan Murphy, features Naomi Watts. Obviously it's going to be a dramatised version of events, but I'm very intrigued to watch it and see how the storyline differs from true life. Honestly, just complete coincidence, I was like researching this and I saw loads of articles that I watched a TV show and then when I clicked on it, it was the day after I'm setting this live, which I just thought was some weird serendipity. I really, really hope that the real life broadcasters have had some input into the series and are at least getting paid for their story to recoup some of the money they've lost. That would be a lovely silver lining in what I'm sure has been a very difficult few years. But again, I couldn't really see anywhere if they have had an input in this, if they've been like directing it in any way. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you have any other requests for any other unsolved mysteries, true crime you would like me to talk about on my channel, then please do leave them in the comments down below. If you're a family member fighting for a loved one, then please do drop me an email. Again, that is in the description box down below and I will do whatever I can to help you out. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.